So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the uh, fourth in our Grand Zoom series, the GHS Grand Zoom series. We've been having a ball getting together uh, with people of note in the game of golf. Tonight, we have Mr. Chris Rodell, uh, the author uh, of a book about Arnold Palmer. He's going to tell us all about it. Uh, he's going to share some inside stories uh, about the um, life and times of Arnold Palmer. Uh, because he has close working relationship with Mr. Palmer over the years. So I usually start out with a little kickoff uh, and take a, a little bit of a pause to reflect on where the GHS was uh, a couple of years ago as a sort of a sleepy group of golf collectors. And now uh, we've gotten a little broader um, because we're finding out that our members uh, are not only collectors, but players. Uh, they're writers, uh, they're superintendents, uh, they're artists, uh, they're everything connected to the game of golf. And that has uh, been fantastic. We have young and old, uh, we have um, ladies and gentlemen, um, and it's been great fun for us to extend our reach. Uh, we currently have two women on the board. Um, we're um, looking to um, recruit to need of the board and become more diverse. So we're hoping that people who may be on the call uh, can be involved in a society in a deeper way because it's very obvious that uh, you care. Uh, so given that, um, we're very excited um, to uh, get on with the program. So I'm going to step back and introduce Mr. Chris Rodell. Uh, Chris, um, you're wearing that fabulous hat. Uh, good evening and thank you for being with us, my friend. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Yeah, the hat was given to me about a month after Mr. Palmer passed away, and I was told that it's the last hat that was on his head. So if you're trying to get into Arnold Palmer's head, getting into his hat's a good start. <laughs> but, it, but my wife doesn't like it. She said, she goes, it doesn't flatter me. And I said, I've been living with you for 25 years, and I've got two teenage daughters. I said, if I start throwing out at the things that don't flatter me, the house is going to be empty. <laughs> but uh, I'm lucky enough to interview Arnold Palmer. As I said, I live right here in Youngstown, Ohio, Youngstown, Pennsylvania, which is where Latrobe Country Club is. And uh, Mr. Palmer, I interviewed him about 100 times. And people said, I used to brag that we were friends. Then I realized Arnold Palmer was friends with everybody. And uh, the thing was, I would have come out and interview him and I'd go up and I'd say, Mr. Palmer, I can't wait to hear your historic insights on these, these matters. And he would say, I can't wait for you to come in here and blow so much sweet smoke up more up my ass. So he was always very funny and very, very alive and, and, and things like that. He was great. The hat I'm going to take off now, because I don't even know that it's authentic, but somebody told me it was the last hat he wore. How would you verify a hat like that? Uh, DNA testing. <laughs> but... Uh, I, I was lucky and I, I did all these stories for Kingdom Magazine on him and I go in and interview him and he was just so much fun. And uh, I think one of the things about him is he became big because he allowed people to see him as small. You know, he never thought of himself as big. He didn't become big until he earned prominence. And then when he became prominent, he shared it with people that were in this small town. People said that I was in his orbit. And I said, that's like saying, like, I, like, I don't like when people say I was a close confidant of his, that's not, not true. I was in his orbit, but I was like Pluto. And people even question whether Pluto is even a planet anymore. So I just don't, uh, but I was lucky to, to be close enough to him like that. I, I got to know him pretty well and I could ask him anything. The last question I ever asked him was about six weeks before he died. I asked him, do you believe there's golf in heaven? And he said, oh yeah, there's golf in heaven. He goes, Hogan and uh, Nelson are having matches up right there now. And there's probably you know, angels in the gallery and uh, the clouds are hazards. So he's already game planning it like that. But I'm coming to you from tin, the Tin Lizzie. I don't know if any of you have ever been here. One of the great misnomers about Mr. Palmer is that he's from La Trobe. He's actually from Youngstown. Youngstown is a one stoplight town that's about 1.3 miles away from La Trobe. He was born in a house that was 320 yards away from the house that he died in, that he was in when he died. And he never left this street. He was at the end of the street, on Arnold Palmer Drive here, which is where the Tin Lizzie is, is uh, Arnold Palmer Country Club, Arnold Palmer's High School, Arnold Palmer's Airport, 
and uh, the house that Arnold Palmer lived in. And that's all in Youngstown. You have to go through Youngstown to get to all those Arnold Palmer places. Uh, Youngstown has just 306 people in it. Arnold Latrobe has 7,900. The last mayoral election in Latrobe was in Youngstown was a landslide. It was 19 to four. So it's a small town. And he never left here. He was, everything he needed was right here on this street. He had recreation, he had food, he had friends, and uh, he had all kinds of adulation. And he never let himself get bigger than, than, than people thought he was. People just treated him just like a regular guy. Here at the Tin Lizzie, there's three bars uh, on, uh, in, on this, in this bar. The, the bar dates back to the 1750s. And my office has been here since uh, the 2016. I've been on the third floor. People ask me, where do you go when you're not having fun at the Tin Lizzie? I say, that's never happened. But if it does, I just go somewhere else in the Tin Lizzie. So I invite you all to come here. Now I bring up the Tin Lizzie, it's prominence because his dad lived here for two years in the Tin Lizzie. It was a boarding house then. And uh, Arnold Palmer was rumored to be born here in the Tin Lizzie. And I asked him one day, I said, is it true that you were born in the Tin Lizzie? He said, he goes, what do you think? I'm like a pioneer kid? He goes, I was born in a hospital. And uh, the Tin Lizzie is rumored to be haunted. And I, I don't believe in ghosts, but I don't like to stay here after dark. And if it ever becomes, if it ever becomes haunted, I'd love to be haunted by Arnold Palmer. You know, he, he just was so great. And he would come into this bar all the time. And there was a bottle of booze that he looked at. It was uh, some, not Kettle One, it was one of his favorite brands and that his dad used to drink. And he would always look up at that and just recollect it. And uh, just, just would set the place alive. He was a collector, as you know, he had 14,000 clubs and uh, 2,500 putters, four tractors, but he just kept two balls that I know of. In his office, he just had two balls and they were from his ace history. Now, the first question I ever asked Arnold Palmer was, What's, uh, which, did, which meant more to you more? Your first, which do you remember better, your first kiss or your first ace? He said, oh, the first ace. I said, why? He goes, it meant so much more to me. Now he went, he had 20 hole in ones. And he went, uh, the longest he went was 13 years without an ace. The shortest he went was one day. He had back-to-back -back aces at Avenel in 1986. And uh, he had the hole in one and he was excited. And then the next day he had another hole in one. He was very excited. The third day he showed up, there was throngs of people there in camera crews. And he said, what are you guys here for? And he said, they said, we're here to get you get an ace. And he said that you should have been here the last two days. And he never got the ace, but he said he felt so disappointed to get three in a row. They said the odds of that were 10 million to one that he got, that he got two in a row. Um, he hit an ace with every club but his putter. He had 20 aces. 66% 60, of his aces were in September with five between September 3rd and September 7th. Five aces in those years between September 3rd and September 7th. People always ask me, did you ever golf with Arnold Palmer? And I, I said, no, I never did, but he almost saw me get a hole in one. He's seen me golf two times. And when you're golfing and Arnold Palmer's watching, like usually when you golf, you have these standard swing thoughts, keep your left arm straight, keep your head down. When Arnold Palmer's watching your golf, my only swing thought was don't crap your pants. And I was sitting there and I got the club back to here and it was on the number two hole, a little par four that he's, par three that he's aced four times. I get the club back to here and a car horn starts honking in my backswing. And I held it together and I hit this shot and this great shot and Arnold Palmer says, oh, that's gonna be good. And time seemed to stand still. And I was sitting there and I'm thinking, I go, if this goes in, this is gonna be the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Now I have two daughters that I love very much, but I was thinking if somebody asked me years from now, what's the greatest thing that ever happened to you? And I'd say, well, I have these two daughters that I love very much, but Arnold Palmer saw me get an ace one time and the ball lipped out. And it was so close. He goes, oh, that was great. He goes, and you holding your concentration together with that jackass blowing his horn in the back, back swing. I run home to tell my wife, I said, you're not going to believe it. Arnold Palmer saw, saw, almost saw me get an ace today. And she goes, hey, we saw you while we were golfing. Josie said, there's daddy, honk the horn. One of my favorite collections of his was he had 66 keys to the city from around the world. Now, I remember getting interested in this when uh, Sully Sullenberger had a... Uh, landed the plane in the Hudson River and saved all those people. And they said, we're giving you a key to the city. And I thought, what does the key to the city in New York City get you? Like, can you get into any restaurant you want? What happens if you give it to a hooker? 
and, and so I asked Doc Giffen, I said, what, what did you do with those keys to the city? You know, can he go anywhere and just get, just go to the stores and take whatever he wants? And he said, we've just used them for ceremonial purposes. He's never used them for anything. And I thought that's a lack of imagination there. If I had one key to one city, I would move to that city and rule over it like a, like a tyrant. And I called the mayor of Erie from uh, 1986 through 2000 when she was term limited out. And I said, I go, you gave Arnold Palmer a key to the city. What does that entitle him? She goes, anything he wants. She goes, we love Arnold Palmer. If he comes back up here, he'll get the finest of everything. She said, he can't go store to store, but if he wants anything, we'll give it to him. And said, please bring him back up. Now I started uh, working with Arnold Palmer in, uh, like I said, about 2000. And I was doing these page a day calendars. I met Doc Giffen and Doc Giffen and I, uh, Doc was, I revered Doc Giffen. And I said, uh, I, I just would show up once a year with these page a day calendars. Does anybody have those page a day calendars? Amazing but true golf facts. I, I did those for like 10 years. And uh, I would go in once a year and give one to Mr. Palmer and one to Doc Giffen. And I didn't bother them and, or annoy them. And so Doc said, he, one time he said, he goes, Chris, will you come golfing with me at the club? And I said, sure, Doc, I would be flattered. And so we played and we didn't have any kind of breakthrough as far as socialists, socializing. And uh, then finally we get to the, 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 the grill room and he said, he goes, Chris, what would you like to drink? I said, I'll have a double Jack Daniels on the rocks, no straw. And he goes, my man. And that kind of broke through with him like that. But uh, I would give him these, these page a day calendars and I wondered what kind of maniac likes these page a day calendars, even as I'm doing it and making money from them. And he'd have things like, who wants to know that Jim Thorpe could hold eight golf balls in each hand upside down? that he had mitts that big, or that a, a uh, lake diver could make $100,000 a year diving in those lakes with the rabid beavers and snakes and that. And I put in quotes that are from people I met. I met this one guy at Oakmont one time. It was 2007. We were waiting on the first tee for Tiger to tee off. He'd driven all the way from Denver to see this, this event. And I said, uh, I go, how long have you been golfing? He said, six months. I said, boy, you've really got the golf bug, don't you? And he said, what I think was the greatest golf quote I've ever heard. He said, he goes, it was the most fun the first time I've been doing anything I was so bad at as the night I lost my virginity. And I thought that was the perfect line about golf. But I said, I, I still wondered who liked, who liked these golf calendars that much. And I one day went in to interview Mr. Palmer and on his desk where everybody else keeps the computer, he had my page day calendar. And I said, do you really like them that much? And he said, he goes, he goes, not only do I like them, I keep them and refer to them back to other people. He loves him so much. Uh, some of the most historic memorabilia he had was the presidential honors. And Sam Saunders at, at Mr. Palmer's uh, funeral memorial was talking about how much uh, Mr. Palmer reveled in those things, but only to a degree, only to a Palmer degree. Mr. Palmer said, uh, Sam said, he goes, I called him one time and he answered the phone. I said, where are you? He said, I'm with the president. And Sam said, the president of what? He said, the president of the United States. He goes, why did you answer my call? He goes, well, I wanted to talk to you. And I love that story. Now, in 2004, Mr. Palmer won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, very rare award, the first golfer to ever get it. And I was in his office a week later, and I said, I go, congratulations on winning the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I said, how about Latro being the only town to get two of those in two years? And he said, who's the other guy that got one? I said, Fred Rogers. He goes, Fred Rogers beat me to it. And I said, yeah. And he goes, damn it. Now, this is like a little part of the history that a lot of our friends don't like to hear about. But there's no evidence that Mr. Rogers and Arnold Palmer, two of the greatest guys on the planet in history, ever got along. And I say that and I thought maybe I misread that situation. You know, maybe I was re reading too much into it. But then uh, I tried to find pictures of Mr. Palmer and Mr. Rogers together, ribbon cuttings or anything like that. There are none. You can't find them. Uh, there's maybe one or two floating around. And people said, well, you're still reading too much into that. You know, it, it, it's not true. They had to get along. They were two, they were one year apart. And I said, Mr. Rogers had 905 episodes of Mr. Rogers Neighbor. He had on ballerinas, athletes, dentists, doctors, lawyers, and he had on a talking gorilla. And he never had Mr. Palmer on. In 905 episodes, he never said, this is my actual neighbor to all his neighborhoods. And he said, this is my actual neighbor. I like to think that they asked the gorilla, 
they said, let's ask the gorilla to be on. If the gorilla says no, let's get Palmer. It's like one of the oddest things that Mr. Rogers and Arnold Palmer didn't get along or there's no evidence that they did. It's just very strange. I did a story in the Latro Bolton saying, I'm looking for the best Arnold Palmer stories that you've got. Here's my phone number, here's my email address. I got 215 calls and emails. I thought I'd get maybe 10 or 15 that said he was cheap. He, he stiffed a waitress. He was mean to me in the grocery store. There was a road rage incident. There was not one bad call. It's like Arnold Palmer never had a bad day. You know, and I think that's, that's relevant because he woke up every day and he was Arnold Palmer. So you never had a bad time with that. I like the story that one of my friend, Joe Holiday, he used to tend bar at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, touchdown club. And he's a great guy. And he said he walked into the Giant Eagle and he saw Mr. Palmer standing there at the, uh, the ticket booth for the lottery. And he said, Mr. Palmer, I just wanted to introduce myself. Your wife gets your dog groomed at my wife's place. And they had this small town connection. So they're talking and laughing for a little bit. Then Mr. Palmer assumes he's there to play the lottery. And he says, let's play the lottery together. We'll split our winnings. Give me 20 bucks. So Joe Holiday said, I look in my wallet and all I had was $20. And I give my last $20 to Arnold Palmer, who at the time was worth about $700 million. He goes, we got two scratch-off tickets, scratched them all off, nothing, no winners, nothing. And Arnold Palmer just shrugged and said, well, you win some, you lose some. And my friend Joe Holliday said, he goes, well, you've won a hell of a lot more than I have. And there was the time that uh, Lester Sutton is a uh, prominent man in town. And uh, he was going down to drive down to uh, Orlando for the um, Mother's Day. And uh, Lester Sutton was, he was very shy around Mr. Palmer. And he said, Mr. Palmer said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm driving with Uncle Floyd to go down to, to uh, Orlando. And Mr. Palmer said, well, we're flying down tomorrow. He goes, why don't you hop in with us? And he said, oh, I can't do that, Mr. Palmer. That's just too generous of you. And I think we've all been in situations like that where you think you want to accept it, but it just seems audacious to say, sure, Mr. Palmer, fly me to Orlando. Let's do that. And he said, no, I can't, Mr. Palmer. He goes, Come on, get in, you're, you're welcome to. He goes, but I have my Uncle Floyd with me. And he looks over at his pilot and he says, do we have room for Uncle Floyd? And he said, yes, we do. So finally he realizes he's not gonna get out of this. Arnold Palmer is gonna fly him in his private jet to Orlando. And uh, Lester Sutton said, he goes, well, you gotta at least let me chip in for the gas. And Mr. Palmer said, son, you better have some mighty big chips. <laughs> I like the story that uh, Arnold Palmer the Arnold Palmer drink is one part lemonade, three parts unsweetened tea. And I always said Arnold Palmer himself was one part champagne, three parts beer. You know, that's the kind of comp composition he had. Like I said, he, he never insisted on allowing others to, he didn't mind others seeing him as small. He never insisted on prominence until he earned it. And when he earned prominence, he shared it with the one small town then the whole world. One of my favorite things about Arnold Palmer was how he treated everybody. He lived the way every one of us could live. He died worth about $800 million, but he lived the way every single one of us could live. You know, he was stylish, he was cheerful, he was optimistic. He was competitive without being bitter. There's so much bitterness right now. People are at each other's throats and it's just so sad. And Arnold Palmer would never have allowed that to happen to him. I like that the last thing he did, they found a uh, letter in his desk a month after he died. It was a letter thanking some strangers who brought him peaches. And I like that the last official act he did before he got on a plane, flew to a hospital where he was, where he died, was a, wasn't a letter saying, let's sue these bastards. Let's build this monument. Let's uh, take this land from these orphans. It was a letter thanking some strangers for peaches. I just thought that was great. Only a handful of people can golf like Arnold Palmer, but everybody in the world could live like Arnold Palmer. I think I like to tell the story. The one story that most cracked him up that I ever talked to him about was uh, a story my father, who just revered Arnold Palmer. You know, he just, just thought he was the greatest. And he continued that on to me. I inherited that from him. And uh, my dad told one I, I think is one of the best golf stories. And Arnold Palmer roared with laughter over this. My dad met Bobby Nichols, and my dad was an optician. And he said, Bobby, I'll get you some sunglasses for free. And so Bobby said, sure, that's great. He goes, if you ever want to come to play Firestone, just let me know. And my dad. Why, that's a great idea. I never thought of that. Yeah. So he goes over and sees Bobby Nichols and they have a friendship and it's eight o'clock on a Sunday morning and Bobby Nichols said, do you want to play by yourself or do you want to play with a member? He goes, I'd like to play with a member. First guy that comes by is 80 year old John Hunsecker. 
he has his voice box removed from cancer. And uh, he goes, how are you doing? And my dad thought, oh, this is going to be so awkward. You know, he wasn't stereotypical about anything like that. But he just thought how awkward it'd be to have 18 holes with this guy if he can't speak hardly at all. They get to the, the first tee, the guy goes, do you want a stinger? And a stinger is, uh, my dad's an old bartender, and he knew a stinger was brandy and creamed him in. My dad goes, my God, it's 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. You want me to drink a stinger? The guy goes, what are you, some kind of pussy? So my dad was goaded into drinking the stinger, and they became great friends. My dad would say, he goes, he goes I've never met a bad guy on the golf course, but I've sure golfed behind some assholes. <laughs> but I was really enriched by knowing Mr. Palmer, and it was all just because of circumstances. I lived for uh, 15 years on Arnold Palmer Drive, and uh, I was doing all kinds of other stories about him. I remember one time my neighbor said, and I, I thought I had a good Arnold Palmer story. The neighbor said, she goes, well, I got to go and watch the golf. I said, well, you like golf? She was an 80-year-old widow woman. And she said, yeah. She goes, I love golf. And she goes, I used to work with, with Mr. Palmer. And I said, what did you do? She goes, I used to spend hours with my hands in his pants. I said, is this a National Enquirer story? She goes, no, I was his seamstress. But you hear those kind of stories in Lake Trobe all the time. And people still tell those stories. We miss him so much. So he was really great. But I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Other than why am I sweating so much? Why don't you take a uh, blow for a second? And um, I, I noticed that uh, John Rusbosan, also of La Trobe, is on the call. And uh, I'd like to introduce John to the group because um, John is one of Arnie's amigos. He's going to tell us what, what are the Arnie's amigos. And John's going to be active with the upcoming Golf Heritage Society's uh, 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 national convention, which is going to be held uh, the end of September and October 1, 2, 3. Um, we're going to play golf at La Trobe Country Club September 30th with a warm up at, up in the mountains there in um, Totter Ridge. And uh, then we're going to be in Monroeville for the convention. And I have to tell you, it's been just an incredible fun uh, planning because um, of the Arnie's Amigos getting involved in pledging the support. I call them the Latrobe hosts. And these, these guys have not only um, got interested in what we're doing, but increased membership of the Golf Heritage Society, introduced us to some wonderful uh, people who are connected within the game. So uh, I'm going to ask John to uh, tell a story or two about the Amigos and then uh, also some of the enhancements that the Amigos are going to bring to our uh, program. John, are you, are you there and are you willing to talk with us? Sure thing. I'll start with a little story about Chris Rodell. Uh, I knew Arnie for about 40 years, and I just really just loved being close to him. But it was amazing when I would read Kingdom Magazine and the interviews of Chris, of Arnie. I thought Chris was from New York City, from Atlanta, some big city. I didn't know Chris. But when I read the articles, I found things about Arnie in those articles that I did not know because Chris just had a way with Arnie to just open up, ask questions, and Arnie would just spill his guts and Chris... Again, I'll always remember those interviews you did with Thorny for Kingdom Magazine. Thank now, you, to get back, Sure thing. To get back to Lake Trope Country Club, I was playing, I played a couple times the last few days, and Saturday I'm playing with the 50th class reunion of Lake Trope High School. So I'm going to be ready for our September 30th event. But as I was playing yesterday, this little old guy was a couple holes behind us. He caught up to us on the 16th hole because we had a threesome. So he played in with him, with, with us. His name is John Sodal. And he says, I'm an old friend of Arnold Palmer. I live in California. I'm here for a wedding. My granddaughter's getting married in Lancaster, and I want to come out and play Arnie's course. And lo and behold, he tells me the story about playing with Arnold Palmer, Dow Finster, old Jack Nicholas at Westchester with Arnie, a foursome, how John played in the U.S. Open. And this little guy was such a pleasure to be with. Such a nice guy, and I hit my best drive of the day on, on 17, and boy, he went right by me, 85 <laughs> years old. And the amazing thing is, reminds me of our convention, the club was basically closed, no, no real activity, but they know me there, and we walk in, so I gave him a tour of the club, and he started identifying picture after picture, telling stories about this and that. It was so entertaining having John 
first time at Light Trope Country Club to tell all these stories about the pictures. And that's what's going to happen to our members when they get to Light Trope Country Club and they're browsing around. They're just going to be thrilled with all the little tidbits they're going to see and experience. It'll be like the Palmer spirit all over again. And our members are going to have a chance to see that. We got to remind people the Palmer spirit is no caps inside the facility. So try to remind all our members, don't wear your caps inside the uh, country club. But back to the country club, it's a thrill. The people playing it, they're going to have their own memories. They're going to see Deke Palmer's uh, carving on the 18th hole. They're going to walk spots where his, historic figures have walked that course, from golfers to politicians, presidents. People from all walks of life have visited La Trobe. They've played there. Our members are going to get that same experience. And we're trying to make it very, very warm, very special. And it'll start with our putting contest. We'll be going all day. And Byrne and Bob Muir, who have really been tremendously coordinating this, this big event, are going to make it fun so we can use balls from a different age, clubs for a different age. So the people playing will help generate revenue for GHS Plus, also get a chance to putt with balls that you don't see very often, right up our land of history and, and the heritage of golf. And that'll be fun. And Danny Clausen, one of our Arne Amigos, he'll coordinate the putting contest. And he's got a couple new members recruited from Lake Trobe Country Club. They'll volunteer to work with them. We've recruited Steph Maraca, and I think all of us will meet her over the convention stage. Tremendous artist. She has a history of golf in her family, and she's going to be there right near the putting contest, encouraging folks to go ahead and try their luck, showing off her original artwork. And she has donated a beautiful artwork that's almost done of the 18th hole, Arnold's tractor, the clubhouse in the background. And some lucky member is going to win that original piece of artwork that Steph is doing. So she'll be there. So we're looking at many ways to make it a fun, warm experience that Arnie would be proud of. Play Trouble will be proud of, GHS is going to be proud of, and we're going to be saying to ourselves, why haven't we come back here before? When are we going to come back again? And we have it arranged already that people in the future could stay at Arnie's Spring Hill Suites and be members of Lake Trouble Country Club in the future. And the folks that attend the convention, they're going to be members for a day. They'll have access to the locker room, all the facilities, meet so many of the nice people. Matt Pellis is the head pro, Jim that works down in the locker room. Many of, of the members are going to be mingling around, warming up the spirits, answering questions. And like when Chris says Lester Sutton or Jimmy Bryan, or there's so many Lake Trobe Country Club members that had very intimate connections to the Palmer family. We're going to try to have a blend of those there, not so much playing, there to add to the aura of being in Arnie's clubhouse get pictures of different parts of the golf courses. There's five very unique bridges on that golf course. It's nice to get someone's picture with one of the Arnold Palmer Latro bridges. Of course, you want pictures with the tractor. And with Steph Maraca there, anybody that's there says, I want an original piece of artwork, just like John Russ has. And I want myself to be in it. And I want the tractor or I want the clubhouse there. She can do originals for folks and make prints for the foursome. It's not cheap, but my gosh, they're lifetime memories for that person that has something or they want to take it back to their spouse and make the house pretty with a golf memory, just like Chris had a number two. People get the idea that you've been there and um, you're excited about the event and uh, very warm uh, to invite people to enjoy La Trobe Country Club. Uh, and that we'll do everything we can to enhance uh, their experience. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a couple people that I see on the list. I know that uh, uh, Gary Van Sickle is uh, on the call. I don't see his picture, but I, I see his name. Uh, and I'm curious, Gary, if you're there and if you can hear me, uh, do you have a, a particular Arnold Palmer story that you would like to share with us? Well, thanks. Yeah. Can you hear me? You're perfect, Gary. Yeah, I'm here. I'm uh, at the same time. I'm also babysitting a five-year-old who likes to play with trains. <laughs> so uh, I've been diverted somewhat, but uh, my son played in the uh, 
the Palmer Cup. It's the Ryder Cup for college kids. You had a team of 10 or 12 American college kids, and they played 10 or 12 uh, European college kids, and it was at Cherry Hills. So during the practice round, there was a big rainstorm. Everybody got chased indoors. So the whole day is kind of shot, and whoever's organizing it said, what are we going to do with this? And they go, I don't know. Well, Mr. Palmer was there. So they said, well, what if, what if we have Arnie talk and take some questions? Well, needless, you know what happened. He came in. You could hear a pin drop in that room. Arnie talked for, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half, took questions. It was the highlight for a lot of people's lives uh, who weren't familiar with him. But we get back to the first hole at Cherry Hills where he hit the famous drove the green in 1961 and win the Open. And he told these guys, uh, he said, oh, one more thing for you college kids. We're, I'm going to sit in the first tee tomorrow. And then if, you, if any of you uh, aren't hitting driver, I'm going to yank it out of your – I'm going to come bring it out of your bag and yank the, yank the club out of your hand. So my son played – First, I think the first time he went around, it they, they played 36. I don't know if he was there or what. But maybe he probably hit driver. Second time around, my son walks to the tee with three iron, and he takes a couple practice swings, and he looks over at Mr. Palmer who's sitting right there in a chair, and he holds up iron up and goes, just kidding. And Arnie breaks up laughing. Whoever was there broke up laughing, and Arnie goes, that's a good thing. I was I just about to get up and go get your driver out of your bag. So it just showed that he was connected to the kids and had a great time and the, the, the kids loved him. So that was, uh, I, I wish somebody had recorded that session with the kids in the practice round because he told stories he did, you know, he was, he was phenomenal. He would be, uh, it would have been viral at, at this point. So my son just walked in and he says, and by the way, and then I drove the green. Oh, with there the you go. So, yeah. but it's playing like 240. So it wasn't that hard, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's ragging on me that's great so <laughs> gary you know um that you, that story will be immortalized because uh we are recording this session and um you got to tell that story about arnold palmer so we appreciate it and we appreciate you becoming a member and uh being on the line tonight with us so um the other person that i saw online here is our uh one and only james davis who's the uh, chief editor of our publication, The Golf. And I saw um, uh, Jim uh, referencing a copy of The Golf. And if he's there, uh, he may want to say a promo item or two about uh, what's coming up. It's, it's not a, a secret but, uh, or a surprise. Uh, but if he's there, I, I would prefer that Jim make the announcement. Jim, are you there? Jim Davis? Well, I've been privileged to work with uh, guys on uh, on this edition with Mr. Osbosen and Mr. Odell and some others uh, to put together a nice story, a nice little package that uh, we're calling the endearing spirit of Arnold Palmer. And this will come out in our uh, with our fall edition of the golf that I just uh, showed you, which has Steph Maraca's uh, nice uh, painting of La Trobe Country Club there. I think it's La Trobe. Is that right, John? La Trobe. And anyway, this is uh, John and Chris helped me proof this thing. So there's some nice stories in there from Chris and John and some others. Uh, the USGA has a little piece in there about Arnie the Aviator. And until I read that, I knew he was a pilot, but I had no idea the depth, the love he had for, for aviation. He said that, uh, man, if I, if I wasn't a professional golfer, I definitely would have become an aviator. I, I had no idea. That was great fun to read and to learn about. And uh, gosh, it's just just good fun been, and working on this thing. I have one small Arnie story to tell. I was never privileged to meet the guy. But in his later years, I played a lot of golf with my father. And he would hit the ball 150 yards, 150 yards, 150 yards, make par and leave me just wringing my hands every time. I don't know how he did that. But we were talking once, I'm saying, we're talking about the, the great golfers. And for me at that time, it was, I thought, well, Jack Nicholas, of course, was the best, was the best, whatever, he's the guy. And my dad just looked at me and said, are you nuts? 
He said, for me, it was always Arnie. Arnie is the king and it will always be Arnie. And that gave me a better perspective on what that was. My father liked this guy. I started paying more attention to Arnie. I wasn't big into golf at that time. But when you learn about Mr. Arnold Palmer, you learn a lot more about life than just golf. That's quite a guy. That's my Arnie story. Jim, thank you for that. And um, uh, we'll get back to part two uh, with Chris in a minute. Um, I'll, I'll tell a quick uh, Arnold Palmer story. Um, Mr. Palmer uh, gave the first tee of Pittsburgh the um, permission to um, name the uh, facility, the new facility. And in his passing, that was never really communicated. So um, the, the, um, the organization, the first tee of Pittsburgh needed to um, actually uh, work through the process of, of getting permission and the Arnold Palmer Foundation uh, and the family, uh, Amy Palmer uh, uh, Saunders in particular, uh, we give great um, uh, thanks to and credit to. And um, there again, uh, the largesse of the Palmer family um, is uh, evident. Um, and I'll just say that in the lobby uh, of the new Arnold Palmer Learning Center in Pittsburgh, right in the city, uh, on the uh, Shenley Park Golf Course uh, in, the, in the building is a tribute to Arnold Palmer uh, as a uh, successful golfer, a successful businessman, um, a, um, a community activist, and a representative for the game of golf. So uh, we're so blessed in Western Pennsylvania to have that spirit of Arnold Palmer. And um, uh, I'll uh, turn it back over to Chris in a minute, but I have to thank uh, Jim Davis uh, publicly, uh, because we had a, a, a kind of a fun idea to have an insert in this year's uh, edition in, this fall. Last year, someone actually gave us a full written um, uh, manuscript for um, Bobby Jones. And we thought it would be pretty cool to maybe do the same for Arnold Palmer. And editor Jim almost had what we call in Pittsburgh a conniption. Uh, he says, that's kind of a large topic. What should we focus on? And uh, at the end of the board meeting, we said, well, Jim, you'll just kind of give it some thought. And when you see what Jim Davis did with that thought, you're going to like it a lot. And uh, with the help of Chris Riddell uh, and um, uh, uh, John Bruce Boson, both of whom are close to Mr. Palmer, they really made this something very special. So thank you guys very, very much. So there. Okay, now it's back to Chris Riddell. He's had a chance to put a cool rag on that uh, uh, warm head of his. Um, he, he was telling us so many cool stories. Why, why don't you carry on a little bit and we'll think of some more things to, to ask you about, um, like the future and your next book, et cetera. But, but yeah. please carry on. Well, I, there's so many great stories. You know, like I, I say, he wasn't really a collector, but he collected like endearing and enduring friendships. Jim Nance said he was a man he most admired other than his father. And Nance said a great story. He said that in 1994 on June 13th, I think it was, he came to La Trobe to visit Mr. Palmer. June 13th was a significant date because it was the last day Mr. Palmer was in a US Open. It was also the day that OJ Simpson was in the uh, slow Bronco chase. And uh, Jim Nance came up here and uh, he saw Mr. Palmer's house. He paid $15,000 for his house in 1955, paid cash for it. And in 1994, he was still living in that house. And uh, he said, Mr. Palmer, he said, he goes, this house is so unpretentious. He goes, it's not in a gated community. There's no guard dogs, no private guards, no, no trespassing signs. He goes, he goes, Arnold, if anybody wanted to, they could come right off the street and knock on your door. And Arnold says, that happens. He goes, Arnold, what do you do when somebody comes up and knocks on your door? And he said, he goes, I answer the door. And I like that Mr. Palmer would answer the door. There's many stories like that where he would answer the door and they'd say, Why don't, we'd like to have a picture. And if he was having breakfast, he goes, come on in. He goes, I'll be done in 10 minutes. And he just was so neighborly. One of my great regrets is when my kids were young, we didn't take them there for a trick or treat. It's Arnold Palmer, trick or treat. Kirk Douglas said that uh, they asked, Johnny Carson asked him, they said, who's the most charismatic man you've ever met? Was it Ronald Reagan, Frank Sinatra? He said, the most charismatic man I've ever met was Arnold Palmer. He liked that. Uh, now, Arnold Palmer, 
I asked him in, uh, we were doing a story about John Wayne in uh, Kingdom Magazine. And I said, uh, did you know John Wayne? He said, no, but I'm good friends with Clint Eastwood. He goes, you know, we own Pebble Beach together, don't you? I said, yeah, I do know that. He wasn't bragging when he said it. I always said that he said it like my wife and I say, we own all six seasons of Third Rock from the Sun on DVD. You know, you're not bragging about it. You're just putting out some information. He just said he owns Pebble Beach. He said, we had dinner together a couple of weeks ago. I said, how's Clint doing? And he said, he goes, well, he's like me. We're both 86, having the same kind of problems. And the thing I loved about Arnold Palmer was I could ask him anything and challenge him and get a great response. I had a banter with him after we got over that initial fear on my part. And I said, I go, who would win a wrestling match right now between you and Clint Eastwood? He goes, I'd kick his ass. <laughs> the competitor in him was just right there at the surface waiting to break through. And then we all roared with laughter. And he said, he goes, well, he thought he'd said something wrong. He said, he goes, he goes, well, he goes, he goes, he has doubles. He goes, I do my own stunts. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time that uh, Gary Player is on the cover of ESPN, the magazine naked. Does anyone remember that in about 2003? He was like 70 years old and he posed naked on the cover of ESPN, the magazine with trophies strategically blocking parts of it. And I said to Mr. Palmer, I said, your, your rival Gary Player is on the cover of ESPN the magazine Naked, I said. And he's bragging about his fitness regimen. He says he doesn't drink alcohol, he doesn't eat bacon, and he does 500 push-ups a day. And I said, uh, what's your regimen, Mr. Palmer? And he, he said, he goes, well, I drink a hell of a lot of Kettle One vodka. <laughs> and uh, he, he got back on track. He said, but no, it's good for Gary to do this that he has a fitness regimen. People should follow that. You know, as we get older, you should stretch. And you know, this, and he, he gave the answer, but I could see it was bothering him that his, his rival had done this ostentatious thing. And so I asked him the next question and he's kind of like distracted. He's kind of bored and his mind's restless and he gets through the answer and then ask him another question. He's still like fidgety, he's nervous and there's something bothering him. In the middle of the fourth question, I said, I started asking him, he goes, oh, and Gary Player eats bacon when no one's watching. And then he kind of looked over at Doc like, I won that one. <laughs> he's still competing with him. I liked it when uh, I could ask him, you know, his historic relationship with Oakmont was so wonderful. And I told him the one day, I said, I go, I'm playing Oakmont tomorrow. Do you have any suggestions on how I can get a good score? He said, I suggest you play somewhere else. <laughs> and I, I liked that I would ask him, it, it kind of bothered me because I thought if I was Arnold Palmer, I'd be flying all over the world in my private jet to play the greatest golf course. And I'd say, honey, I'll see you in a month, you know? But Arnold Palmer played Lake Trobe Country Club day after day after day. And I said, I go, you know, if you wanted to, you could play Oakmont or you could play Laurel Valley, two just outstanding golf courses. You remember it at both of them. I said, or if you wanted to, you could get in your plane and fly to Augusta and be back by dinner. He has done that many times. And uh, he, he had uh, Dr. Jimmy Bryant with him the one time and they were in the champion's grill room. And Jimmy Bryant told me that he goes, on the other side of that door was Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett. And I was in a room where they couldn't get into. And so he'd go down there and fly and play Augusta. I said, but why do you play Le Trobe day after day after day? Le Trobe's a great golf course, great atmosphere. But if I'm Arnold Palmer, I'm jetting to Pine Valley all over. And he said, he goes, it's just so close. And I love that answer. You know, and I paced it off one day. His, his front door was 1,967 steps from his front door to the first tee. And I swear if there was a course that was 1,965 steps from his front door to the first tee, he'd play that instead because it would save time. I like that uh, you would see him play. Um, can you see me? I just lost my, my, my light went out. Can you see me? Yeah, we got you, Chris. Okay. My light just exploded, but uh, I was, it was in 2000 before I started dealing with Mr. Palmer at all on a professional basis. And my buddies and I were playing the Elks, which is a great local blue collar course around here. And uh, we play the number nine and we're going through the parking lot to get to number 10. And we see this uh, black Escalade pull up where nobody dares to pull up. You know, there's a place where you park your cars and you lug your bag up from there. And we said, who does that guy think he is? And out pops Arnold Palmer. And uh, so, oh, it's Arnold Palmer. And I, I just love that this day, me and my buddies woke up and said, today would be a great day to play the Elks. And Arnold Palmer woke up that day and said, 
guys, let's play the Elks today. And the great thing about it was he played and they had their fun. He went into the bar afterwards and spent like two hours in there drinking beers and signing autographs with guys. I remember guys were getting their shirts signed, like, you know, with a big jersey and all that. And that was before selfies, but he just went in there. He knew he would make everybody's day and he did. And he was just so much fun. One of the things I loved about, uh, we talk about how much he loved Latrobe. One of the times he was most engaged in one of the interviews was about September 13th, 1969. And he used to have a, uh, they used to sell this bag tag. John probably remembers this. Arnie's best score ever, his best round ever. And he had a 60 on 19, in 1969 at Latrobe Country Club. And it was the most flawed 60 anybody could imagine because he had a, he had a bogey on number six, which is a drivable hole you can reach it into. It's, it's so short a par five, I've reached it in two and I'm not a golfer, I'm a big golfer, strong golfer. And I've reached it in two. He bogeyed that and that's a birdie hole. He said that set him off so much that he went on a tear. And he started birdie, eagle, birdie, birdie. Then he bogeyed number 10, which is a par three, which he shouldn't have bogeyed. Then he went on an even bigger tear, birdie, birdie, eagle, eagle, birdie, birdie. And he got to 17, which is the easiest hole on the course. He parted. And so he is, he's looking, he needs a three on 18 to part to break 60. And he part 60, he part 18 too. And I asked him, this was like 30, 40 years later. I said, I go, still so bothers you? He goes, it bothers me almost every day of my life. And he got pars on the last two holes. And there's a great story about our friend, Bob Ford. And I, I, I revere Bob Ford. And I think most of you do too. He's just a great gentleman. He was playing around that Sean Knapp, the, the great amateur of Pittsburgh said, he goes, I've never seen anybody golf like this. And I've been playing on the pros tours and I've seen all the great golfers. He goes, I've never seen anybody golf the way Bob Ford was golfing at Lake Trobe that day. On 16, Bob Ford was playing so good. He had the, he had the course record in his hand. He had no chance he was gonna blow it. He would have to bogey, bogey. And it wasn't gonna happen. He picked up his ball and he walked into the clubhouse. He said, we said, why did you do that? He said, because I wasn't going to break Mr. Palmer's record in front of him. He goes, there's no way I'd do that to Mr. Palmer. And I, I've talked with a lot of guys and mostly caddies say, what's he crazy? He should have broken that record to be his forever. Hey, Chris, uh, over your right shoulder, as we're looking at it, it's to the left. I see the, the picture of your book. It says Arnold Palmer and there's a little uh, glare right under his chin. Uh, there you go. Um, and uh, homespun stories of the king. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I read it, uh, maybe a week or so after I met you, I couldn't put it down. Oh, thank you. Uh, and it was so much fun. And, uh, you know, I got to meet some of the uh, folks um, who are named in the, uh, in the book and um, some of those locals and some of them are the amigos. And um, it's, it's good stuff. Thank you. Um, and, and we appreciate that you take the time to hang out with us a little bit. It's my but pleasure. It, it, it begs a question, uh, Chris. Um, you know, when we get together at Latrobe, and, and you all heard how passionate John was about people coming and bringing their stories, uh, we thought it would be a great idea to invite people to see some of our Arnold Palmer collections. So we're going to have a series of Arnold Palmer displays great. of collectibles. Yeah. And we're also making arrangements, uh, as you and I've talked about, wouldn't it be cool to have a videographer collect stories oh, about great. Arnold Palmer? Yeah. So we're, we're, uh, we're working on that. You know, I, I sit up here in this office and people say, what do you do for a living? They expect me to say I'm a writer. I say, I stare out the window. And they say, what do you mean? I say, I stare out the window for like an hour. Then I type for like a minute or two. Then I resume staring out the window. So I've got time if you have any occupation for me. Uh, Chris, would you mind if we opened it up uh, to some questions from yeah. the audience? Yeah. Uh, we've got about 20 folks there. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure some of them have questions about uh, what it was like. Uh, before we go there, I, I would really appreciate it if you would uh, tell us about uh, someone uh, that I know you've had interaction with. How great and how important was Doc Giffen? He's immense. You know, he's immense. When I started talking, when I started dealing with the Palmer people, they'd say, what's it like working with a legend? And they meant Arnold Palmer. And I said, Doc Giffen's the greatest. You know, he, he's, he's that way. And uh, I was privileged to be friends with him for a long time. And uh, he, he's just great. He's, he meant so much to Arnold Palmer. 
and he was the public face. Like when you would get a letter from Arnold Palmer, a lot of times Mr. Giffen had a hand in it. And he was just a consummate gentleman. And like I said, that one time, like I said about the, the bourbon, we had a shared fondness for bourbon. And uh, I said, like, we didn't have a breakthrough and a buddy buddy out moment till the 19th hole. And I, he said, what do you want to drink? I said, I'll have a double Jack Daniels on the rocks, no straw. And he said, my man, you know, he <laughs> loved that order. And uh, I remember a couple of weeks later, I was in his office and I said, uh, you can watch the pirate game tonight. He said, no, tonight's Wednesday night. And I always sit and watch Survivor with Jeff Probst. I said, my man, we watched Survivor together. And uh, I enjoyed that so much. But he meant the world to Arnold Palmer. You know, he was, he, there's not enough said about Doc Giffen, I don't think. You know, he was that kind of gentleman. And uh, I liked it then, and back in 66 or whenever it was, Arnold Palmer asked him to be his aide de camp, his assistant for, for, for as long as he could. And Doc Giffen quit his job as the press secretary for the PGA Tour. And all the golf writers said, what are you crazy? This guy's a golfer. His career is going to be over in a couple of years. And Doc Giffen said, I have a feeling Arnold Palmer is going to be popular for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. He has a great sense of humor. And uh, I've been very fortunate to work with him. Wonderful. Wonderful. Chris, well, we'll open it up, see if there's questions. See, uh, past president uh, uh, Bob Geddes there has his hand up. Bob, want to have at it? Thanks, Vern. And Chris, thanks so much for this evening. It's Thank been you. wonderful uh, hearing the stories and, the, and the, enjoying the humor uh, behind them. Uh, I kind of remember, of course, growing up and watching uh, Mr. Palmer all through the years. And I don't know whether it was the 80s or the 90s. Somebody on the line, I'm sure, will remember. But when he was having his putting problems, there was a time when he went to like a white putter. He was, yeah. I think... Uh, trying to spray or paint white paint on the putters. I think the story was to take the glare off the putter oh, so he might uh, putt better. But uh, I understand, too, of all the putters that he has there in La Trobe, that many putters were from people that sent them to him. Yeah. And they were their favorite putters because yeah. they wanted to help Mr. Palm. Yeah. Could, could you speak to that a little bit? Well, he had 2,500 putters. And he had some of the greatest engineers in, in golf working to, to find him the putting stroke that he demanded from himself. And he would consider all those, but he would also consider the ones that were sent from like the guy in Iowa that said, this putter works magic for me, try this. And they all ended up in his garage and he tried every one of them. He didn't play favorites. He thought some local guy in Iowa could have just as good an opportunity to fix his putting stroke as some engineer could. And he kept all those 2,500 putters. Some of them were like, there was one that I always remember that had guitar strings. So he would hit it and it propel the ball like that. Some were little bottles of booze. And he said, I tried every single one of them. And he, he loved them like that. That was such a joy to go, as John Russbosson remembers, to go into that workshop and see all those putters. It was like a playground. And he was always in there working on the putters and, and the, the golf clubs and re-gripping and things like that. That was his solace. He just enjoyed it so much. I, I loved going in there because, you know, we have this revered image of Mr. Palmer, but everybody in that office treated him just like he's just their boss, you know, and like Gina or, or Debbie, he would, Mr. Palmer would yell, Gina, and you know, it's just give me a second. I'm in the middle of something. And it's like, you're talking that way to Mr. Palmer, <laughs> but it was such a lively atmosphere. I'll also acknowledge uh, past president, Jim Jesselnick. Um, and he, uh, Jim, uh, had a, uh, uh, an event in, um, in Indiana, the Michiana, and uh, he, he is also a uh, Arnold Palmer um, advocate and Arnold Palmer um, interested party. Jim, are you there? I'm right here, Bern. Yeah. So um, are you bringing any Arnold Palmer material with you when you come to Pittsburgh? I've been collecting, I probably have about 20 items. Um, there's at least two more in the downtown antique shop that I'm going to go pick up before I leave. And, um, and I purposely got a third table just to have all, it's going to be all Arnold Palmer on the table. Great stuff. Great stuff. So as a physician, I'm going to recommend that after all that wear and tear from organizing that event, you have a double Jack Daniels on ice, no straw. No straw. You got it. You got it. <laughs> oh, and I had a, a question for Chris, too. We talked yeah. a lot about Arnie. Um, can you speak a little bit 
to Winnie? Have you you have you spent much time with? Did you spend much time with her? And then um, I was at La Trobe Country Club back in April because yeah. I was close for a wedding, and, and Matt got to show me around the place. Super nice guy, and um, and I asked him about Cat, and he said that he thought. She just sold the house and she moved from there. So yeah. can you can you talk about those two women in his life? My, my life with Golf Writer, I, I was writing for Golf Magazine and, and a bunch of other magazines. And uh, they had a big event and Golf Magazine asked me to cover it. It was all Palmer's Enterprises at Country Club. And somebody said, uh, they go, where do you write for? And I said, I write for Sports Illustrated, Maxim, Golf, and all these others. He goes, what part of Manhattan do you live in? I said, I don't live in Manhattan. He said, he goes, where do you live? I said, if you look out that window, you can see where my dog crapped this morning. <laughs> and uh, at that time, then I started doing more with Mr. Palmer. Prior to that, the one interaction I had with Winnie Palmer, who was beloved in this area, just absolutely beloved and revered still, was we were with our golden retriever and uh, we were at the little post office and everybody in town has to go to the post office one, once a day. So it's like a social event. And uh, she comes up, she's dressed like a, she had like this garish jewelry on and she was like, looked a little odd. And she was so friendly and joyful, which made her very odd in this town, <laughs> other than John Ross Boston and our friend. But uh, she comes up and sees the dog. She goes, oh, what a beautiful dog. And she starts playing with it. And she goes, he's just wonderful. You must bring him up to see our prince right away. Just call me, call me Monday. And my wife goes, who was that? I said, that is Winnie Walford Palmer. She married, she eloped together with him that night. I read all everything, like, because I was floored. I said, we just got invited to the Palmer house. I said, this is going to make our career. Our dogs are friends now. <laughs> but but uh, she, was, she took ill, and that's when she was fighting her cancer. Got it. That was the only interaction I had with her, and it was joyful. And she is still revered to this day. Now, Kit Palmer was still revered, too. She was very, the, the house was sold and she moved to California. Now, I think they, they started asking 1.2 million for this house. Many of you might end up seeing it. It's on the end of Legends Lane, right across from Latrop Country Club. And uh, it's a, not an ostentatious house at all. I said that he could have been pampered around the planet in palaces, but he chose to live on the same street. I can't emphasize that enough. He never left this, this street right here in front of us, 320 yards from the house that he died in, the house he was born in. And uh, the house that he sold for, they put up for 1.2 million is impressive if you think it's Arnold Palmer lived there. But if you're buying it for a reason of re reality or real estate, you're not gonna spend $1.2 million on this house. It only had two bedrooms because he didn't want people staying there and crowding out the house. But uh, I think it sold for 600,000 recently, which is probably normal. But there's 20 houses on this street that are worth more and more impressive in the house Arnold Palmer lived in. He just wasn't, as I said, he never minded people looking at him as small town. You know, he, he revered that. And he, he just was so joyful and generous with everything he did, his time. And uh, he was great. They were great people. Good. Chris, I have a final question. But before yeah. I do that, I want to acknowledge a couple more folks. Uh, George Petro uh, is Region 1 Golf Heritage Society Regional Director. And Glenn Howeisen uh, is Region 4 um, Director, and they're on the call tonight. I, I, I want to thank them publicly for all the great work uh, that they do for the Golf Heritage Society, and uh, especially the work that George is doing uh, as our Director uh, of Communications Committee. Um, you, we've done these Zoom calls, and uh, we're working together on social media and and. and the website with Jim Davis and George, and uh, it really is enhancing our ability to communicate with each other and um, uh, share great um, uh, friendships like we're doing tonight. So uh, the society's moving in the right direction with a lot of great people uh, working together. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention uh, that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the all working together, we're getting so much done. And uh, Bob Geddes and his willingness to jump into an unknown thing called Facebook and, and help us out. So uh, that's all good stuff. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, Chris, you know, in your conversations, I know uh, Arnold Palmer was a very humble uh, man uh, and really quietly 
supported things that were important to him, like uh, youngsters working with youth in the first tee. I saw that firsthand. Um, can you say that um, uh, he talked much or share with us some of his passion uh, for charities and things that meant meant uh, something to him? Could you give us any insights there, Chris? Well, there's people that are probably better than that than I am because they were firsthand. But I just know that like, he had such a quiet philanthropy about it, you know, that he didn't like make it known. Like he, there's a friend of mine, he's a state police officer and he works with uh, cops shopping with shop with the cop. It goes with underprivileged kids who've been through trauma and they take a state police officer and at Christmas they go out and it's a wonderful organization. And this friend of ours told us that he went to see Mr. Palmer and he had a request and uh, Mr. Palmer said, well, think about it. Thank you very much. And he said he was hoping for $5,000 to help with it. And he said he got the check, it was $50,000. Wow. You know? And like I, I said, when I put that note out there that I, I wanna hear your best Arnold Palmer stories, I thought there'd be some that would say he was cheap. He was rude to me at the restaurant. There was never a bad word about him. You know, he enjoyed being Arnold Palmer and he excelled at it. You know, he wanted people to know how much fun it was. He was an example of what it is to be a great human being something we could all live by and again he, he had 70 million or 80 million in the bank when he died but he lived like we could all live and that example right now is needed more than ever well chris rodell um you're a gentleman um you're a brilliant writer and a lot of fun to be with I, i've had uh, a couple of great experiences hanging out with you um, and I look forward to spending some time with you when we're in both Latrobe and in Monroeville, because I know you're going to uh, have a special session. Yeah, you're going to interact with folks and hear some of their stories and share some of your stories. So we very much look forward thank to that. You. We thank you for tonight. Thank you. And, um, I think I'll wrap us up. And uh, uh, I think Bob Geddes has his hand up. I'm going to see if Bob... Uh, wants to say a final thing oh he's he's, he's giving an applause does everybody show it yeah hey very good Burn. thanks so much Burn. Uh, yes Burn. go ahead go ahead jim uh, just a reminder on wednesday september 8th is our next zoom grand zoom call and it's going to be with bobby grace um and he's going to share 40 years of collecting and passion and the things that really got him excited about joining our society. That's good stuff. Yes, uh, Jim's going to be the moderator of that. And I'm going to put out a video, two videos that I did at uh, uh, Columbus in May. Uh, and I hardly knew Bobby Grace when I got there. And we had a, a, a little session in the lobby um, and uh, it was fun. Uh, and then during the uh, trade show, Bobby... Um, taught us a few things uh, and it was a lot of fun. So I'm going to put those out and I guarantee you uh, that Jim and Bobby are going to uh, show us a good time. So he's, he's a real entertaining guy. So uh, that's two weeks from tonight, 7 PM Eastern time. Don't miss it. And tell your friends uh, that are GHS members to uh, join in and uh, get a hundred friends each uh, who are not friend, uh, GHS members yet and tell them they got to, they got to tune in to, to Bobby Grace. So become a member and join our zoom parties. Very good. Thanks for that, Jim. Okay. Uh, is, is there anything else for the good of the order? We might as well open it up. If anybody wants to make another announcement. One thing I forgot to mention about the uh, golf outing at Lake Trope country club, the 19th hole is really going to be a fun experience for all of us. Uh, one of our new members, Bill Hillgrove, who's a legendary sportscaster for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Pitt Panthers, tremendous guy, knew Arnie very well. He'll be in that little bit of a fireside chat panel. And another new member, Jim Rakowski Sr. from Erie, was very, very close to Arnie for about 60 years. And Jim will be on that panel, but there'll be a lot of intimate stories. I think we'll all enjoy it. If someone has a special story and you're in the audience, be ready in case you're called on to share your story. Uh, we're all looking forward to that. That's the uh, Thursday night uh, as we get into the uh, uh, GHS convention. So, John, thanks for all your efforts. Thank the Amigos for me. And uh, yes, we'll see you all soon. See you in two weeks. Thanks Thank very you. much, everybody. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. I look forward to seeing you guys in late trope.
Sounds good. <laughs>